Welcome to that lecture online and now we're going to take a look at some general rules of how we can determine the oxidation numbers of atoms or ions and things like that. Well, you may want to ask first a question, why in the world would we even want to know that? Well, if you can come up with the oxidation numbers, it'll make it easier to figure out how ions and molecules are put together because essentially it is a sharing and an exchange of electrons that determines the bonds in those molecules and ions. So just another tool in the toolbox to figure out how to come up with the ions and, and molecules. So, back to how do we figure out or how do we determine the oxidation numbers? Well, there are some general rules. Of course, what we can also do is go to the periodic table and look at all the various oxidation numbers each atom can have and just plainly memorize them. But I've tried that before and that's pretty difficult to do. So general rules sometimes help us figure out about half of them and then the rest, well, either you remember them or you go look them up when you need them. All right, so what are these general rules? Well, first of all, when atoms are in an uncombined state, the oxidation number is simply zero. So when we have hydrogen gas or oxygen gas, the oxidation number is zero. When we have lithium atoms and sodium atoms, the oxidation numbers are zero. So that makes it easy. All right, secondly, when we have a single one atom ion, the oxidation number is always equal to the charge of that ion. For example, when we have a single oxygen ion, and it has gained two extra electrons, the charge on the, elect on the atom or on the ion will be minus two and that will also be the oxidation number. When we have a single hydrogen atom, or in this case an ion, with one electron removed, then we know that the charge on the hydrogen ion is a plus charge and that also then the oxidation number, plus one. And let's say we have a chlorine ion, very likely it will have gained an extra electron because it's pretty electronegative, and so therefore the charge on that ion will be negative negative one, and that's also the oxidation number. So there you can see that the oxidation numbers are usually the same as the charge on that ion if it's a single atom ion. Next, when we're dealing with oxygen, the oxidation number is almost always negative two. Oxygen is very electronegative, it's an oxidizer, it steals electrons from other atoms, so typically it will steal two electrons for every oxygen atom. There are some exceptions, however, for example, when oxygen combines with fluorine, so we have oxygen difluoride, you will see that the oxidation number is different. It's a positive two instead of the typical negative two, and that is because fluorine is even more electronegative than oxygen, and it's more likely to grab electrons away from oxygen than oxygen will be grabbing electrons away from fluorine. So the oxidation number there is an exception in this particular bond. And also, you can see that when it, when it mixes with hydrogen in this particular fashion, H2O2, which is hydrogen peroxide, you can see that in this case, the oxidation number is minus one instead of minus two. So there are some exceptions, but the general rule is that for oxygen, typically it's minus two. Now for fluorine, it's always negative one. Fluorine is the most electronegative element on the whole periodic table. It's the one, it's the king in grabbing electrons. So when it comes to oxidation number, it always will be negative one. It will always grab an electron for every fluorine atom to satisfy its valence band so that it goes from seven electrons to eight electrons, grabbing that extra electron, becoming negative one in charge and having an oxidation number of negative one. For hydrogen, the oxidation number is typically plus one. So what that means is hydrogen is very likely to give off um, uh, an electron and become positively charged. So hydrogens only have one proton and one electron, and hydrogen typically gives that one electron away, although there are some exceptions. When we look at the first and second period atoms, it turns out that in case, for example, lithium, lithium is more likely to donate an electron than hydrogen is, so lithium will give its extra electron to hydrogen, where, so therefore the, oxi the oxidation number for hydrogen becomes negative one. Sodium, the same way, it's more likely to give off its electron to hydrogen than the other way around, so this becomes plus one, hydrogen becomes negative one, so those are exceptions. There are not a lot of those for hydrogen. And then finally, the sum of the oxidation numbers should always equal the total charge on the molecule or ion. For example, ammonium ion, NH4, is positive one charge for the whole ion. If we look at the oxidation numbers, the oxidation number for nitrogen will be the minus three, and for hydrogen will be plus one. So there's one nitrogen atom and four hydrogen atoms in that ion, and notice that the total sum, minus three plus four gives you plus one, which will be the charge on the ion, which is the sum of the oxidation numbers of all the atoms in that particular ion. Now notice, we do have to multiply the oxidation number of hydrogen times the number of hydrogens we have. So that's what we mean by the total 
oxidation number. It's the oxidation numbers of each atom times the number of those atoms that appear in the ion. And they should always match the charge on that ion. So these are the six rules, general rules, and they help us determine what the oxidation number is. On the next video, we'll go ahead and take a look at the whole periodic table to see the trends in the oxidation numbers on the periodic table. And what we know is to be always the case and what we know are options depending upon which other atoms they bond with. All right, so hopefully this will give you a pretty good idea of the general rules of oxidation numbers.